we are going to be recording this a bit. Um, so thanks for joining us for, for this launch. Um, I'm going to quickly share what we're going to cover in the next hour and a half is uh, we're going to kick off first with a short presentation that my colleague James and I will go through for about 25 minutes or so that uh, gives you a bit of an introduction to who are we, who's them next, uh, why did we want to do this work and why do we believe there's a need to democratize city planning. Uh, we'll cover the, the high level proposals of the six ways that are in the new paper that we released today uh, with some information about an open call for applications from cities to help realize these ideas and bring them to life. Uh, we're really delighted and honored to have two of our international task force members here with us today. So we will hear from Ifoma Ebo and Daniel Fusco and um, uh, Daniel Fusca, sorry, uh, and, um, and my colleague James will introduce both of them properly with their full bios before, before he introduces them later. So before I kick off our presentation, um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague James to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is James. I'm a project leader for urban design and planning at Democracy Next. Uh, I really come at this work as a former landscape architect, uh, having worked in Canada and Germany for many years. Um, I really approach this work with the perspective that people in general are just not generally engaged in decisions being made about the cities that they live in, and uh, we're working to change that at Democracy Next. Um, so who are we at, at Democracy Next? We are an international nonprofit and nonpartisan research and action institute. And we believe in a more just, joyful and collaborative future where everyone has meaningful power to shape their societies. Our mission is to work to shift who has power and how we take decisions in government, but also other institutions in daily life, like workplaces, schools and museums. We're an international knowledge hub on deliberative democracy, creating tools and resources like our assembly guide to build the field and experiment with innovative governance approaches. We also advise on the design and establishment of new democratic institutions, processes and spaces, including citizens assemblies. Ultimately, we want to make more people see the democratic potential of sortition, meaning selecting decision makers by lottery, deliberation and participation for strengthening trust, reducing polarization and improving decision making. We believe that these three principles enable us to be with complexity, to channel our collective wisdom and to find common ground with one another. Behind our lovely graphics and all the text, uh, these are the team members of Democracy Next. Uh, all of us have been really involved in this project, as well as our fellow Gustav Gjavjad Nielsen, who helped in some of the research and joined us with our international task force convenings as well. And he's also here with us today. Um, so to do this work, uh, what we really, what we, what we found we needed to do was to really tap into a much larger collective intelligence. Um, so this is why we asked an international and diverse group of people to help us shape the proposals we will present here today. Um, this involved working together online and virtual meetings, uh, sussing out some of the most pressing challenges facing cities and their decision making processes, while also hearing about some incredibly inspiring examples of citizen engagement from cities all over the world. Um, so we came together uh, in September at the Humanity Hum in The Hague, where uh, Demnex is headquartered. Uh, to sketch out an outline for the paper and proposals we'll share with you here today. Um, also, after the convening, uh, we shared the drafts of the paper, the initial drafts of this paper, with a, a large group of people, almost 100 people from around the world, uh, to get their feedback as well. Um, this was a really extremely insightful and helpful opportunity and really shaped the final outcome uh, of the paper that we'll present today. So why did we do this work and why do we believe that there's a need to be democratizing city planning? Um, well, many of the biggest issues that cities are facing today are down to city planning related issues. So whether that's housing to do with high rents or home prices, affordability or lack thereof, shortages, homelessness, NIMBYism or YIMBYism, uh, climate mitigation efforts, also the links to, to public health and also inequalities that are, are related to these things. So while each city has a different context, what we found from some of our early conversations with people in different cities across the field uh, were that these are commonly shared issues and that there's also a commonly shared set of frustrations amongst diverse actors in the ecosystem from the planners to the architects, elected officials, public servants, and of course, 
citizens. Um, so we really believe that we don't just need different policy solutions to these issues. We need a different way to take planning decisions. New governance models can help break through deadlocks and give legitimacy to hard decisions that require trade-offs. We also have a great deal of inspiration and evidence from a different way of doing things. So close to half of all examples of citizens' assemblies that have taken place around the world have addressed urban and strategic planning issues or environmental issues, also wants to do with health and infrastructure, which are also often interlinked with this. Um, and these are just one part of a much larger trend towards more democratic and legitimate forms of decision making that are taking place across the globe. And we've also seen that cities are leading the way. They're at the forefront of this innovation with most of the examples that have taken, taken place in the field. So since citizens assemblies have taken place mostly at this local level, and usually for questions around urban or strategic planning or the environment, uh, we thought it would be good to give uh, just a couple of concrete examples which are referred to in the paper in more detail. So the first here is Bogota's Itinerant Citizens Assembly, which is an effort that actually one of our task force members, Felipe Rey, who I believe is here today actually, uh, played a part in shaping. So in 2020, the Bogota City Council, through its Public Innovation Lab Demo Lab, launched a sequenced representative public deliberation through the Itinerant Citizens Assembly, as they've been calling it which is directly attached to the city council. This is an example of a permanent ongoing citizens assembly that has had numerous chapters or assemblies over the last four years and has involved hundreds of citizens from all 20 districts of Bogota who have been tasked with forming recommendations on land use regulations and the 20 year vision for the city. Uh, meanwhile, in Copenhagen, um, an ad hoc citizens assembly was initiated in 2023 uh, to facilitate citizen deliberation over a significant climate infrastructure and urban development project that was actually greenlit without initial public engagement. The project uh, involves the creation of a new island uh, intended to pre protect the city from storm surges while creating land for a massive new urban development. Um, after receiving a lot of backlash and stirring up plenty of controversy, it was decided that a citizens assembly would be initiated to shape the future of the project. Uh, the question the citizens were actually asked was, how can Luneta Home, which is the name of the island, uh, become a district that supports sustainable development for people, nature, and the environment in the capital area in the future? So this is an example of how um, a city is, is really trying to reconcile the con controversial decisions that were made without pu early public engagement. Um, an initially sort of weak co a democratic conversation with citizens was eventually transformed into a strong one by empowering them to scrutinize the project and come up with recommendations in response to the question above. So citizens' recommendations are, the citizens' recommendations have now been published publicly and handed over unedited to the citizens' representation in the municipality of Copenhagen, and we're awaiting now a response from the municipality. So these two examples uh, out of the over 200 or so related to urban planning issues sort of bring to life in a less abstract way why these principles of sortition, deliberation and participation can really help to unlock the potential for new ways of, of doing things. Um, sortition being really one of the things that's quite different to many other engagement processes that typically happen um, where the, the, where while there's a really nice and, and, and good intention with having open processes, this means there's a self-selection of people who, who tend to participate, um, meaning those who are most mobilized. And we've also seen from the research that this tends to also be people who are the most well-off, who have the most time, um, who end up dominating consultations and, and drowning out the voices of many other people. Um, and in, in some cases, really amplifying the inequalities which are, are aimed to be addressed by having consultation in the first place. So sortition, um, and meaning randomly selecting people helps to counter this and, and how that works in practice um, tends to be in two stages. So in a first instance, there's a very large number of invitations that go out completely at random to a community. Um, and that invitation is addressed by public authority. So that could be signed by the mayor or a city council or the chief city planner in this case, um, laying out what is the issue that is to be tackled and how is this process going to work? Um, you know, how many meetings are there? When do they 
take place, uh, the fact that people will be paid, that childcare will be provided, um, you know, answering sometimes frequently asked questions around things like, you know, no, you don't need to wear a suit, um, all the stuff that helps to try and really break down as many barriers to participating as possible, um, so that there's a large pool from which there can be a second lottery process that takes place. Um, and this time there's uh, a technical aspect called stratification. This just means it's a process to ensure that this final group is broadly representative of the wider community when it comes to things like gender, age, uh, geography, and socioeconomic criteria, and sometimes other factors. Um, it is a bit of a political decision to decide by which criteria should this group be representative of this, of this community. Um, the, the second principle of, of deliberation is, and deliberation really meaning actually weighing collectively evidence and coming to a shared decision off the back of it. Um, and so citizens assemblies are deliberative because they're really creating this time and space with the resources for people to really um, hear and understand the issues better, to weigh the complexity of those issues, to build trust with one another, and to be able to do that harder work of, of really working towards finding uh, uh, common ground on shared proposals, uh, because a common feature of these assemblies is that people need to read, reach 75 to 80% consensus amongst themselves for it to become a recommendation of the group. Um, so while it might be somehow a bit easier to come to a town hall meeting and complain about something or, or really talk about one issue that really matters, um, it's a lot harder when you have to come together and actually work together towards these constructive um, propositions where you need that 80% consensus threshold as well. Um, and the participation element is important too. The community engagement phase that's that's up here really matters um, and is crucial for feeding in as evidence base for the assembly. Um, and in a wider way, these assemblies really um, embody the fact with people having an equal chance of being selected to be part of them, the idea that everybody has agency and dignity to participate in shaping decisions that are affecting their lives. So for all of these reasons, citizens' assemblies are at the heart of our six proposals for democratizing city planning. Um, and these examples also highlight our focus on systemic change. Uh, One-off approaches have been needed to test what works and show us what's possible, but they've also highlighted that it's not enough to fundamentally change things. So our six proposals are focused in a way on changing the rules of the game. And there are three types of assemblies that are at the heart of these proposals, which we'll explain as we go through each of the different examples. So there's ad hoc ones, meaning they're one off. Uh, there's community level ones, so at a, a kind of very or hyper local level, and there's citywide assemblies. But our proposals are not just about assemblies either. We've thought about how these democratic institutions need to be in relationship with public authorities, city councillors, urban planners, developers and investors, and civil society organizations too. And beyond that, how they need to be connected to people who are living in cities more broadly, linked up to other engagement initiatives like community mapping or citizen science initiatives, data gathering and other participatory approaches. It's about expanding this ecosystem and really improving the different relationships between these different actors who, who are involved. So what are these six ways? Uh, we're gonna talk you through the, the, the proposals in a somewhat high level way here so we can open up to conversation. And there's a lot more detail about each of them in the full paper. Uh, and James is gonna go through, through the first four of these. All right. So the first scenario we outline is if you are a city or a region about to initiate a major infrastructure project, so thinking like a subway line, a climate infrastructure or something similar, um, consider initiating an ad hoc citizens assembly. So since this infrastructure project is likely to have like long a long lasting and significant impact on communities and the city at large, we suggest implementing this assembly uh, type to shape those initial project objectives and perhaps some of the key design goals to align them more closely with the community's needs. This also has the potential to reduce public pushback, uh, criticism, and could actually avoid uh, the high cost of a prolonged public hearings uh, process or protests. Uh, taking the example from Copenhagen uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, initiating an assembly at the beginning of that process might have actually helped to avoid some of that pushback that resulted in protests. It's also possible to think of the assembly not only as a one-off engagement pro uh, process, but also as a recurring set of assemblies related to that specific infrastructure project. So in terms of a project that may last 10, 20, or more years, 
there could actually be more than one deliberation uh, than just at the very start. Um, in the second scenario, we imagined uh, the, a second scenario that we imagined is one where if you are a developer in the early early stages of a large urban development project, it could be extremely beneficial to initiate this process with a citizens assembly. So in some cases, the developer is not actually always the bad guy, and they are sometimes just as frustrated with the current status quo for engagement. So why not initiate one to generate uh, a higher quality community supported design strategies and site programming that in turn enable the creation of places and developments where people can connect, live and thrive. This could also help to reduce risks for the developer, for investors, and create better conditions for future investment while securing greater public buy in. A third scenario where we see an ad hoc citizens assembly being helpful is in the creation of a city's long term strategic or financial plan or in the creation of a significant piece of urban policy. So typically people are just not part of shaping wider visions of the place where the places where they live, but by in, in including them, um, you can create the conditions for a diverse set of perspectives life experiences and visions for the future to come together. This could also have a trickle down effect on policies that come out of that planner vision, which could also then be informed by an assembly or wider participation strategies. And then finally, a fourth um, version we see that ad hoc citizens assemblies could be used uh, or could be useful is, uh, uh, is in within changing, possibly changing the legislation around mandatory public engagement. So. While we're working within the bounds of reality at the moment, perhaps there are ways of changing this existing legisl uh, legislation around what kind of engagement is legally mandated and when. So from our conversations with numerous people working in government or in urban development, it's clear that there is a frustration with the status quo of the of town hall style public consultation. Uh, often these forums don't include a diversity of perspectives and are poorly designed, as in they don't create the conditions with the time and space to carefully consider options, trade-offs, and the complexities of a project. We're not saying that wider public engagement is, uh, isn't necessary, but we do argue that considered informed and constructive forms of public engagement need to be part of that wider ecosystem and could potentially be legislated as a baseline standard for engagement in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, shifting to one of the other kind of assembly types now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the community citizens assembly that we've thought about. So many cities of all different sizes tend to have this more hyper local level of resident engagement with what are sometimes called either community boards or neighborhood associations or neighborhood councils. Um, and these are typically either self-selected, sometimes elected bodies, but they're, they're usually not very representative of the neighborhoods that they serve uh, and typically don't always have a huge amount of direct influence and power on decision making. And those two issues, of course, reinforce one another, because if the group is not very representative, then it lacks the legitimacy to speak on behalf of the community and doesn't really reflect its diversity. So there's a question of should this actually have decision making power in that current form as well. Um, so what we've thought about is we've proposed some reforms to how these types of councils or assemblies work with some suggestions about how it could be possible to transition to new ways of working. Um, so I also want to say that we do really recognize that there's a ton of good will and intention amongst people who volunteer to get involved in these sorts of, of neighborhood councils that exist. And so we've also thought about how to partially replace the membership of these councils so that some remain self-selected, but that more than half of the members are chosen by sortition to be more representative of a community's diversity. Uh, we've also reflected on how the mandate of these councils could evolve and how they could be connected to the other types of assemblies that we've outlined. Um, and so to keep a mix of, of seasoned and fresh perspectives, we've also suggested that half of these members could be replaced each year with new members um, who are also selected by, by sortition. And I mean, we took every year as like a, an example time interval. This could vary depending on how things are typically done in a place, of course. But the principle that we wanted to get across here is one of that rotation and, and the mixed membership. Uh, and finally, we have also reflected about what could be an ongoing citywide level initiative, um, that there could be an ongoing assembly with members rotating over time and each assembly taking place on, on new issues. Um, and of course, like the focus of all this work has been on city planning, um, but the framing of a, of a more anchored citizens assembly could also be slightly different. So for example, there's a permanent citizens assembly in Paris that has a general mandate, although thus far, most 
most of its work has actually focused on planning issues, given how central this is to, to local city government. Um, so right now, the, the assembly that exists is working on two citizen bills, one to do with homelessness and one to do with greening the city, for, for instance. Um, this is the, the assembly in, in place. Um, and there's also a permanent citizens assembly for climate in the region of Brussels, where again, many of the issues that it's dealing with concretely intersect with city planning. Um, so if the desire is to keep it general or frame differently from our perspective, what really matters is the establishment of something that's more anchored as an assembly that connects in to the city council, the administration and other relevant institutions, and that there's this connection to feedback and input from a wider community informing its work. Uh, a crucial aspect of this that we think is important is also that this uh, assembly should have agenda setting power, so perhaps it can decide what would be the theme for a one-off assembly on a specific issue that needs some more in-depth attention, uh, because they have a bit of a longer form mandate and a closer relationship with city council, um, they can be more informed about that. But they could also have agenda setting power within the assembly itself. So, for example, in Paris, where I was just mentioning, um, the city council at the start of this assembly cycle in September presented the assembly with three of its most pressing issues to choose as the focus of one of its bills. The assembly deliberated amongst themselves about that, and then they were the ones who voted and chose to work on homelessness. And then for the other issue, uh, the assembly members brainstormed ideas bottom up, and then they voted amongst themselves to work on greening the city as the other priority area. So this is what we mean by agenda setting. And as they meet more regularly and for a longer period of time, it's also more possible to actually go into the deeper complexity of some of these long-term urban challenges like homelessness, which, you know, in this case, they're working for nine months to come up with propositions for what might be done around this issue differently in, in Paris, that a shorter term ad hoc assembly would not necessarily have the time to really try and tackle. So we've shared these six different scenarios and starting points, and, and I just want to zoom back out for a second to this image to wrap this up and, and really emphasize how taken together, these different proposals would be really transformative for how city planning works in a city. Not all of them will necessarily be relevant in every single city, but most of them will. Um, and depending on a city's context, we think there's always at least one starting point where someone could actually get started. Um, but we also want to make sure that these ideas do not just live in a pretty paper. We really want to bring them to life and inspire other peoples to do that as well. So we have an open call for applications to cities to, to be working with us to try and make this more systemic, transformative change happen. So what do we mean by this in terms of, of how collaboration would, would work? Um, we would guide each city through a learning program. So going into a bit more of the nitty gritty details of sortition and deliberation and citizens assemblies and, and the other ideas and the proposal of, you know, how this can connect to citizen science and participatory data gathering and all of these sort of things. Um, we would also run a context building knowledge sharing workshop where the learning would be more for, for us, uh, getting a sense of a city's political, um, social context, its institutional setup and framework, um, getting an understanding of how things currently work and, and understanding what the pain points are and what the opportunities for change can be as well. Um, once that mutual knowledge sharing has taken place, we'll coordinate a design workshop with relevant local actors and stakeholders as well to make sure that this is something really co-developed and co-designed with local actors too. Uh, we are not a practitioner organization, and our aim is really to be building more capacity and more places for people to be able to do this themselves. So we would be working either to build the capacity of a local organization or be collaborating and working with um, local practitioners that may already be um, operating on, on the ground in the city where we work. Um, but we would be providing ongoing advice and guidance throughout the implementation phase of the assembly process itself. Um, the idea would also be to coordinate knowledge sharing and learning between the different cities that are in the cohort, uh, as well as conducting research and evaluation to make sure that we learn from these experiences and what happens and be able to promote and disseminate these activities and learnings too. The application is open for municipal governments, civil society organizations, as well as developers. 
uh, and wanted to just flag some of the key dates for people to have in mind. And these are all in our in our open application as well. But there is about a month now to submit an expression of interest. So hopefully that gives everyone enough time to, to read through some of the details in the paper. We're hosting some information calls next week as well. Um, the initial uh, expression of interest is a fairly short list of questions. So um, we hope to, we will be interviewing an initial short list of cities after this. Um, and after that, there's a, a longer application application that does demand a little bit more work, but relates to questions that from our experience have shown to be really some of the crucial elements of what we think needs to be in place for this to be a successful project together. Um, and so we'll also be holding some info calls and other stuff closer down to, to that line uh, and hope to choose the, the three cities by the end of May so we can start working together from, from June onwards. So thank you very much for, for your attention. We're really looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts and your questions about these ideas. Uh, but before that, I'm gonna hand it over to James who are, is going to introduce our two speakers uh, for today. Thank you, Claudia. So we're very lucky today to have two of our task force, a few of our task force members here, actually I've, I've seen. We'll have two of them speak, um, just to discuss their, their experience working with the task force and, uh, and to share their thoughts on this work as well. Uh, so first up, we have Ifo Mahebo, uh, who is the founder of the design studio Creative Urban Alchemy. Uh, she's an experienced designer, planner, and architect with a proven track record in transforming urban spaces into platforms for equity and design excellence. Uh, through leadership roles in urban design and development initiatives funded by the United Nations, FIFA, and the New York City, New York City Mayor's Office, she has excelled in leading multi multidisciplinary teams and engaging in the design and planning of projects supporting racial, social, and cultural equity. Ifoma is currently Assistant Professor of Design and Sustainability at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York, where she teaches transdisciplinary courses exploring social, climate, and environmental justice. So I'll pass it over to Ifoma. Thank you so much. And um, it's been great to just like see Claudia again and um, just see just a, a great synopsis of the amazing work that you guys have been up to and that I've been fortunate to be a part of. Um, you know, my, I'm based in, in Brooklyn, New York, and I've worked for city government in New York City for, um, you know, close to a decade. And my root, my practice now is deeply rooted in community engaged practice. And so it was really a great opportunity to sort of really collaborate with other um, similar minded people. Um, we all traveled to The Hague and we spent a few days just really digging deep. And it was just, it was people from Mexico City, from Canada, who you'll see um, talk next, um, uh, just really all over the world. And um, all of us talking about uh, de a de democratic processes um, in our respective places, but then also at different scales. And I think that's something I want to emphasize here that, you know, it is emphasized that it is about government work, it is about planning, but I think this work that is has been developed is also a way of working um, at the architecture scale, at the public art scale, at the urban design scale, um, whether it's nonprofit work or public sector work, um, I think it really is applicable in, in diverse contexts. And I could see it even applying to the diverse types of work that I have done and that I am currently doing. And so much of my work is rooted in, in marginalized communities, particularly for communities who haven't had um, a seat at the table or haven't had a voice in the process. And I think this way of thinking about um, how decision-making can be more collaborative, more democratic, I think is important, particularly when dealing with issues within marginalized communities and, and really trying to find a way that, um, you know, de decision-making um, around the transformation of public space, the transformation of communities in general can be more democratic. And that's what I find that is really, um, you know, important and critical for, you know, the application and the use of, of this, of this, uh, Citizens Assembly tool. And I know there's been some conversations in the chat about, about, you know, citizen. I mean, the term citizen in particular, and you know, in, in the context of the United States, it's a very, it's a it's a term that's fraught with a lot of um tension because citizen refers to someone who has who actually has the like legal documentation to be in that country. And there are many instances where there are people who are undocumented and they're living and they're contributing to a society. And so I that's one of the things that I brought up 
in our conversations. And it was happy to hear that as a very general term that's used um, and not particularly related to people who perhaps have a passport in a particular country. And I think you know, that is something that, you know, is is um, definitely, was definitely considered and thought about and talked about in, in our conversations. Um, and I think, you know, th this, this issue of ways of dealing with equity and decision-making, I think strategies that are ro rooted in the act of moving at the speed of trust, that is a principle that I often use in my work, moving at the speed of trust, which can be very challenging. And when I say moving at the speed of trust, I mean moving at the speed of which the people who are beneficiaries of the projects that you're be working on, that they actually trust the process. They trust that the outcomes will stand to benefit them. And so how much more better to build that trust in a process than to actually really involve people in an authentic way in decision-making, in a way that actually generates results that are collaborative, that are from the collective. And I think that's another reason why this, this tool can be very, very, very powerful. And I think but particularly, I mean, yes, I've worked for city government, but working for developers, which I think often are seen as the mean guys in development projects and perhaps don't even have the capacity in their own businesses or in their own organizations to engage in the right way, to engage in a way that people feel like they had a role to play in the final development, in the final transformation, and in whatever the final project is. Um, and so I think, you know, in that context, it can be really a, a powerful tool. So I'm going to end um, on that point and definitely participate in the in the discussions afterwards. But um, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and um, I hope all of you really do sign up for this really great opportunity. Thank you so much, Yohoma. So nice to see you. So, so great to hear uh, hear you speak about this project and, uh, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. That's perfect. Um, so next up we have Daniel Fusca, who is the Manager of Public Consultation for Toronto's Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division. So he's a recognized leader and innovator in municipal civic engagement and an expert in process design and policy development. Uh, for five years, he served in Toronto's Chief Planner's Office as the Stakeholder Engagement Lead for the City Planning Division where he pioneered the use of civic lotteries in Toronto and worked to bring new, hard-to-reach and equity-deserving communities into the planning process. In Toronto's Park Forestry and Recreation Division, Daniel and his team have been working to build an engagement practice from the ground up, ensuring that Toronto's diverse communities are engaged in the development of Toronto's Parks and Recreation Capital Program. To date, his team has engaged close to 200,000 Torontonians in this work. Daniel is also a trained facilitator and partnership broker and teaches on civic engagement at the University of Toronto. I'll pass it over to Daniel. Thank you, James and, uh, and Claudia and the whole team at Democracy Next. And hello, everyone. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today to talk to you and the opportunity to have participated in this task force. Um, as you heard, my name is Daniel Fusca and I'm the manager of public consultation in Toronto's Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division. Um, I do lead a team of 12 uh, people who support the implementation of the division's 10-year capital budget and plan, which if approved at council tomorrow will be $3.6 billion, um, which is the largest ever, so very exciting. Um, and we do that by designing and implementing public consultation processes uh, that ensure our capital program is designed and delivered in collaboration with community. Uh, but before I talk more about that, I do want to start with uh, sharing a short story about an event that I was at yesterday, uh, organized in part by Jennifer Kiesmatt, who is uh, another, another member of the task force. Uh, and the event was um, all about the provision of affordable housing, how we can speed up the provision of affordable housing um, in, um, in, uh, in, given, given the, the, the dire need for it in, in the Canadian economy. It's a, it's a huge crisis right now, uh, housing in general, but specifically affordable housing. And there was a panel that was part of the event, um, and there was a developer on the panel, and there was an architect on the panel and some others. And um, one of the panelists, and, it was, and the, another agreed, um, argued that against public consultation, argued that public consultation was something that was slowing down the provision of housing and that was a problem and a barrier uh, to 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 successfully achieving the out the goal of more housing and especially uh, uh, they mentioned um, engaging people on design as as being problematic in their opinion um, and that they felt that the engagement created a, a platform for NIMBYs uh, and and that it created delays 
And I just wanted to um, uh, to reflect on how fundamentally I disagree with that position. Um, you know, I, I really feel that as Ifoma, uh, you know, very eloquently spoke to, we need to be thinking about public consultation as an opportunity to really solve problems and to make better decisions. And I believe that we, we need to therefore stop seeing it as a problem or a barrier to success and to really start seeing it as a critical element of success. And I believe that when we thoughtfully and when we meaningfully engage people in the right ways, and yeah, on the right questions as well, often, um, we can solve problems, we can imagine new things that we otherwise might not have. And actually, I think that through good public processes, we can build community support for projects, ensure they stay on track, and, and also increase trust in government along the way. And one of the exciting things about being part of this task force was that every single member of the task force um, has, has done work that is proof of the value of public consultation and public engagement when done well. And ultimately, I think the framework that was presented to you today and that I hope you will take some time to look at is an outcome of the perspectives that have been shaped by these rich experiences. And I think it's a path to better decision making, but only if we understand and appreciate the valuable role that the public can play in the decision making process. So it was an honor to work with the whole with the whole uh, group, and I learned so much from each of them. And my own experience with citizen assemblies began um, back in 2015 when I was working under Jennifer Giesman at the time, who was chief planner of the city of Toronto, and my boss. And taking inspiration from our city's motto, which is diversity our strength, we launched the Toronto Planning Review Panel to bring more diverse voices into Toronto's planning process. Uh, the planning review panel was a 28 and then 32 member panel uh, selected through civic lottery to roughly represent the demographics of the city of Toronto in terms of geography, age, uh, gender, race, indigenous identity and housing tenure. So whether they owned, whether they were owners or renters. And then in the second iteration of the panel, we also represented the population living in subsidized housing and the population with a disability. And panelists met roughly every two months for a total of 16 meetings over a two year term. And the panel was run for two, a total of two terms. And the model we chose to adopt was something that, as far as I'm aware of, uh, had not been tried before. Although, as you've heard, there are now panels that do exist um, over a long term dealing with multiple, many different issues. Um, and, and our consultants, who were MassLBP, a Canadian firm that's been promoting and implementing citizen assemblies for a very long time, well over a decade, they weren't sure if it would be successful either. You know, but we tried it. Uh, we, we tried it and, and we, we, we wanted to know, we wanted to see would a group of random volunteers keep coming back to be engaged on different topics over a two year term. And the project was widely regarded as, as, as a success at the time. You know, the panel, it provided input primarily into policy development and we brought projects at various stages in their life cycle. And panelists generally helped us refine the work, providing some advice along the way. Um, which, uh, you know, it is a very minimal, a very uh, constrained role. I understand that. Um, but people did come back. You know, the attendance rate was high. We had an over 88% attendance rate on average. And the most common rate of attendance was 94% of meetings. Um, and staff loved their interactions with the panel and really valued the constructive feedback that they received from it. And meeting after meeting, I observed panelists taking an intense interest in the work we were doing. Uh, listening and learning from one another and attempting to provide constructive feedback that balanced the needs of all the people in the room and of their neighbors and of their friends and of their and of their and of their acquaintances. And afterwards, our panelists told us that the experience had had made them grow as individuals, and in particular that they felt more empathy uh, for their neighbors, which was a really a really fantastic thing to hear from them. And so this experience made me realize that there's really a magic to this approach, you know, that bringing people together, random people together to solve problems is something magical. You know, it really takes people out of the realm of self-interest and asks them to think about things from a different perspective, from the perspective of, of their neighbors, of the people around them, of their communities. Um, and I think that the world needs more of this kind of work. So fast forward a couple of years and I was hired to become the first manager of public consultation. And as you heard, I've had the privilege of building a practice from the ground up. 
and and with that privilege came the opportunity to test new 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 approaches to implement new processes and one approach that we've adopted and have been using more and more of is the use of civic lotteries to establish citizen assemblies that represent local communities to act as advisory bodies on major projects and this is a change in, in from how the planning review panel worked which was a, a city-wide body that wasn't attached to any projects we've also added in in this case additional members who we've invited to participate who represent community groups and we collaborate with them and their input directly shapes the designs of our projects right they help us craft vision statements design principles actual developing the development of design options and then the refinement of a preferred design option. And we pair that with wider public engagement and with indigenous engagement, you know, with surveys, with, with, in, with, with meetings and workshops and pop-ups to really build the credibility of the process, as you heard of, uh, earlier from Claudia and, Jay, and, and James. And the benefits to our projects have been increased public satisfaction of project outcomes because designs are better tailored to address community concerns and community needs and community aspirations. So it was all these experiences and all the things that I learned from them that I took with me to the task force meeting in The Hague last September. And I think honestly, it was quite wise of Claudia and her team not to have too many people like me on the panel, too many converts to the religion of citizen assemblies and, and civic lotteries. Um, because you know this group of, of leading international experts in architecture and landscape architecture and data science and community organizing, you know, many of them were not even familiar with the concept of citizen, lot of, of, of citizen assemblies. Um, and so they approached the work of the task force really critically, I and I would argue sometimes with, with scrutiny, um, but informed by the huge diversity of experiences and insights that, that they came to the project with. And so I think that the outcome is a framework that is balanced, a framework that includes something for everyone because it, it identifies realistic entry points for people with different roles in decision making. And I think that's such a valuable and exciting thing. And I'm so proud of this work and I hope it resonates with you and that it inspires you to try something new and do what you can to support local democracy in the place that you live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. It was very nice. Very nice to have a, a, a rising endorsement. We really appreciate that. So I'll pass it back over to Claudia there. Yeah, I thank you both, uh, Daniel and Ipoma, for sharing your your reflections and your thoughts. And and you know, it's it's nice to see you both again. And we haven't really connected too too much as a group or anything since the the Hague. So it is nice to hear how this has kind of stayed with you and your thoughts about the whole process af afterwards as well. Because it's true that we did bring together a mix of people. This was not some group of citizen assembly advocates that came came together, and we heard quite a diversity of perspectives. And it was also hugely valuable actually to bring in you know the things thinking around like participatory data um, and, and map making and how that can feed in. And, and you know, from different perspectives, there were lots of different approaches that came in and I think together we we came up with something that hopefully does feel realistic and, and is inspiring too. So thank you. So we have um, we have a good amount of time now also so for some, some questions, uh, also discussion, you know, people, if you don't have to necessarily have a question, you can also share some reflections and thoughts. We are a pretty big group. So I think I'm and rather than inviting people to just jump in, uh, if you want to use the little like raise hand um, option, um, I will kind of moderate this part of the conversation and um, the questions can be can be fairly wide ranging. I, I see that there has been some stuff kind of already going on in the chat. I'm one of these people who finds it impossible to like pay attention to a conversation and read it at, at once. So I haven't caught all of the, the questions, but if you want any additional um, elaboration on the stuff that has been posed in there, um, or you'd like to come in, um, there is an opportunity to do so now. Uh, and it's always that moment of waiting for the, the brave people who want to <laughs> want to go first. But I have no doubts there are going to be some some questions and comments. So I think, oh, there we go. We're we're getting going. I'm gonna I'm gonna group these um in two or three uh before coming back out to our group. And this can be kind of addressed to anyone or shared as a general comment. So I'll I'll go in the order that these are up, starting with uh Simeon. Sorry, I should have known how to admit it, you know, three years already. Um, I, I think it's really, really interesting. And I think um, the, the kind of the six ways that you've outlined are really, really interesting. Um, my question was more about the actual participants in the season and how you select and what is the support as well. Um, I work a lot with teenagers and, and kind of vulnerable people. And 
um i think just thinking around that what how 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 has that experience been you know do you see any issues with people who might require more financial or experiential or any any, any type of support you know how does that kind of work out in the citizen assemblies hmm. thank you that's a very good very good question um and i'll also call on josh Hi there. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody for the presentations and for putting this together. Uh, I, I currently work in the city of Toronto for a city councillor and wanted to thank Daniel specifically for his comments regarding uh, just everything that he's done in the city and also the, uh, the uh, planning review panel, which we still get calls about to this day from people saying, when are you going to bring it back? Uh, so uh, it, it truly is great. So I, I had a question, which I think um, Afoma had a point about moving at the speed of trust, uh, which I thought was really impactful. And I'm wondering in contexts where we have like ratepayer rate payer associations or uh, different things like that, how do you build trust in a citizen's assembly? How do you sell that to people and say, you know, this is not something that we're doing to pat ourselves on the back and say that we've went out to the community, but how do you say that, you know, this isn't your traditional ratepayer model or anything like that? You know, we want to produce results uh, and just wondering how you could speak to incentivizing people to come out to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh. That's also a very good question. Um, and we, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we, we can take those two, those two for now. Maybe I'll, I'll open up to, to Daniel and Ufoma first, if you'd like to answer them one, um, one question being about how how people are really selected and also this aspect about you know vulnerability also younger people or teenagers any anything around that um as well as this question around this the speed of trust um and how to actually ensure and, and build trust in an assembly so i have some thoughts but i'd love to hear from from you first i don't know if, maybe daniel would you like to go first and share some of the practical experiences from toronto as well on this and then we can Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So in, in answer to the first question, you know, how do we support vulnerable community members to participate? Um, <clears throat> there are some lessons that I learned from my experience with the Toronto Planning Review Panel. We did not pay people um, at the time to participate in the Toronto Planning Review Panel. Um, and I do think that was a barrier to some people being able to participate. I mean, we did support people by paying for their travel, you know, if they had to take transit or a taxi to get to the meetings, we would pay for that. We paid for their food and, and uh, we did not skimp on that. <laughs> we, 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 we treated people pretty well um, and, and they got fed throughout the day. Um, but nowadays we do pay um, an honorarium. And, you know, I work, I work with a capital budget, but capital budgets are, are, are usually more flexible than operating budgets. And so we do have that benefit of being able to pay honoraria to, 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 to people who are more vulnerable, who, 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 who might have more barriers to participation. And so that's how we approach that. Um, but, you know, it really does take a lot of work. Um, you do have to sort of be in touch, be in regular contact with panelists. You know, um, our consultant mass LVP for the Toronto Planning Review Panel would call people. They also had like a, a, like a, like a hotline that panelists could call any time if they needed if they had a question or anything like that. So, so the two things together, I think, are necessary for success. Um, the other question was, how do you legitimize um, uh, legitimize the role of a panel in the in the face of in the eyes of uh, of existing stakeholder groups? I think Josh, uh, which I think also is a really good question, um, and it is a, a a challenge we've been trying to to address. Um, uh, I do think that citizen panels on their own do face the ch do face that challenge of legitimacy. You know, who who are these people actually? Um, and what one of the one of the strategies that we've been using is by pairing participants selected through civic lottery with those community leaders who represent those established uh, groups, right? And actually forcing those people to into these kinds of conversations with just like regular representative samples of people. Um, and I think that that has been leading to really, really interesting outcomes. Um, people do listen in those circumstances. Um, they realize that they're not the only voice in town. Um, and, uh, and we've been seeing a lot of success in that way. So that, I think that's one strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing, Daniel. Uh, Ifoma? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I co-sign on everything Daniel mentioned, especially the points about paying people for their time, lived experiences and expertise. And I think it needs to be acknowledged in that way. And so people's contributions are no different than an, bringing an architect or an urban planner um, into a conversation because nobody knows a, a community or a neighborhood better than the people that live there. Um, and so they should be compensated for their time. I think also, you know, when we, we are setting up these citizens assemblies or meetings or conversations that they should be held where people are. Um, and so making it physically accessible, I think is also key. Um, I think this, this, you know, question about moving at the speed of trust, I think just the, the mere fact that you're to be thinking about a citizens assembly and forming a group together is the beginning of moving at the speed of trust because things can easily done be done by ballots, surveys, and not really having concentrated conversations about what the issue is or even defining the problem, I think is key is who is at the table to define what the real problem is, not what you know the larger organization or the established institution thinks the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, you know when you when you do bring people together in that way, that is the beginning. And also just the, you know another thing is reckoning with the future. I think making time in the conversation about what has been done wrong or what wronged, how, you know, how, what injustice or how people have been wronged. I mean, particularly when working in marginalized communities. And I think this tool of a citizen's assembly is a great platform to have that conversation where you are bringing people to the table to define the problem and even just like define how things have been done in the past so you don't repeat those mistakes. I hope that answers your question. Mm. Thank you, Afoma. And um, I definitely like want to repeat and plus one your point about lived experience being expertise. Uh, and actually people with lived experience often know a lot better actually the nature of what the problems are as well as potential solutions and people who are a million miles away from feeling the problems directly themselves. So um, valuing that is, is important too. Um, I do want to just maybe interject before moving on to, to our next set of questions to add that um, like in the wider bit of research that we've done with my colleague Yeba, who's also here um, uh, in the room with us when we were looking when we were still at the OECD um, digging into the data of different assemblies that have taken place in most cases people people do end up getting paid to, to be assembly members and we also definitely support that being the case for you know if we if we want this to be a genuinely democratic and not just a technocratic exercise then that really that really matters as well um, so how much that is varies you know the idea is that it doesn't become the incentive in itself but that it really does take away those barriers for, for people to participate. And um, I think also one of the last things you said, Foma, uh, reminded me of one of the other aspects, which we didn't touch too much in the presentation, because there's only so much you can cover in 25 minutes. But one of the other things that was really interesting in some of the thinking around this was to do with the spatial aspect and where what are the spaces we need actually for these kinds of deliberations and these democratic gatherings to be taking place. And I think I saw his name in here. I, I don't want to like force him to intervene or, or pick on him, but um, you Johan Gulster is from We Do Democracy in Denmark, and um, you actually saw some of the pictures from some of their beautiful space in Copenhagen, and it was really an initiative of the founders of We Do Democracy to establish this physical space in the city um, as a place where there's also like a bakery and a co-working space and a bar and other things, but there's also like a space where citizens assemblies are, are being held. Um, so I don't know if, if Johan, if you are here and if you'd like to say anything about that, I, I would love to invite you to, to chime in after our next round of, of, of questions too, because um, I think that's an important, important part too. It would be nice to weave in, uh, but I'll turn over to, to Anna now for, for her question or comment. Morning um, from New Zealand. Um, yeah, I'm I'm interested in in kind of um, taking the question one step further back in the process, and interested in people's experiences of trying to um, encourage local councils, in particular, because that's my my area, to actually take this on board. We yeah, I I find in New Zealand we're really struggling to get local government to go beyond the that's a nice idea and into that actually let's let's try that let's give that a go so really interested in people's experiences of how they do that hmm. 
Thank you, Anna. That's definitely a good question. Um, I mean, I don't know, I guess this is one maybe, Daniel, you have a little bit more experience with directly. Otherwise, I'm also happy to share a bit from our experiences in the DevNix team of the work with local councils too. Um, and I don't know actually if this is something, Ifoma, that you would like to come come in on. You don't have to answer in every every round either. So, <laughs> so maybe Daniel, I'll ask you first. You know, we, we don't really have the problem of having to convince council in Toronto of the value of public engagement, thankfully, actually. Um, it's generally under, understood to be a value. Um, uh, but I do often have to convince colleagues of the value of public consultation <laughs> and um, and doing things differently. And one of the arguments that I often make is, is like, this is actually about, you know, good public consultation is actually about ensuring um, that you avoid delays, ensuring that a project stays on track, ensuring that the community will, will ultimately support the project, will go to council and dispute in support of the project instead of against the project. You know, that these are actually hedges against things going wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and the, the fact that outcomes are just that much better when people are engaged in the, in the process is kind of um, an added benefit um, that I think is central, but <laughs> is not always the argument that 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 wins the day. So I do think that this idea that public consultation, when it's done properly, can really support uh, the the delivery on, of projects. Um, I think is uh, is a is a really strong argument that I that I that has worked for me. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Actually, from my own experience, I've also found it. Um, less difficult to be on the like to be convincing counselors and more difficult with the public administration side sometimes um that actually on the council side there's usually some recognition that there's a number of issues on which like politically we're stuck um and it's hard to take a decision one way or the other things have been delayed you know maybe there was a decision and then there were protests and so the decision was taken back and so usually from my experience an entry point into doing a citizens assembly as trying another way forward has been from a position of problem solving and trying to find um a new way of trying to solve the problem but also try to garner legitimacy for for the solutions or the the I don't know, I don't really always like the word solutions, but you know, for the proposals of how are we going to try to address this in a in a different way. Um, and and sometimes on the public administration side, there's there's a little bit of, of skepticism or or hesitancy, sometimes a lack of faith in the capacity of everyday people to really understand the complexity of the issues and so on. So there is a little bit of like a learning curve to get a sense of how it, but also I think they've been shaped by experiences of public engagement as town hall meetings or other. Other forms of much less constructive forms of engagement. So there's some sense of empathy of understanding, like how uh, what is the perceived view of what is the public um, when that's been your main mode of, of engaging. Um, and this is a very different experience to be um, in a much more constructive relationship. Um, I think, you know, I thought it was interesting you were saying, Daniel, in one of your previous replies, how it's actually also the staff who find the these advisory boards really like useful and, and helpful. So I think it's also like one of those things that once one happens, it's actually pretty easy to get more going after that too um is the is the experience that i've had um so yeah um i don't know if there's anyone else who wants to come in i've also had a, a little flick through and see there's a few of our other task force members that are here so if you would like to intervene too i know i called out one of one of you who i happened to notice earlier but any of you are welcome to to come in and we're also welcome welcoming other questions or or reflections too um, and I don't know if James, you wanted to add anything else from the earlier interventions. Yeah, well, one thing I just wanted to add was, uh, I'm not sure if Anna saw, I, I just uh, posted a little thing in the chat to say that um, if you had not seen that before, that in Wellington, they recently did a citizens assembly kind of on city planning, actually. So it could be worth talking or connecting with them as well to ask how how exactly they convinced council to, mm -hmm. to get that off the ground. Um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm also interested to hear from Johan as well, because uh, you brought up a good point about the spatial infrastructure. We didn't go into that in this presentation, but it's something we touch on in the report as well. And it's something that the 
uh, Gustav and I are actually working on as well around the design elements of uh, spaces for deliberation and what those spaces could look like and how they could function in a more permanent kind of embedded way. So um, yeah, as we said, Johan works for We Do Democracy uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, in Denmark, <laughs> where they are a practi practitioner organization uh, delivering citizens assembly. So I'll pass the floor to you, Johan, if you, if you would like. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks, uh, Claudia, for, for mentioning it. Nice to see the members of the task force here and, uh, <laughs> after HACK. And, uh, and um, some reflection on, on having this place in Copenhagen, uh, Democracy Garage. Uh, we actually started up in Copenhagen during COVID. It's a bad idea, kind of, you know, <laughs> taking over an old garage uh, filled with, uh, with cars and uh, dump and actually move it out. And then from there, start from stretch and uh, and and bringing out the cars and then bring in democracy as a place where we actually kind of have a discussion between elections about how is everyday democracy, how is the community in a neighborhood that is kind of, you know, this again, the old industrial area in in Copenhagen. So so by having this um, by having this place where we can actually meet and have a look at democracy, not just as something kind of you know at the election um, practice, but but also in in everyday basis, in everyday life is kind of you know. I've been formerly uh, chief uh, for communication at the Danish Architecture Center, and uh, you know the architects in Copenhagen, the engineers kind of have such big places to meet and discuss but about democracy and how to actually form the future of the city in the, in the software of how should we interact how should we kind of make the activate the 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 citizens in the in the big uh, solutions this kind of you know that that was the idea of having this garage this innovation place for democracy in copenhagen and then um, and as uh, some of you have seen, when we had this uh, Democracy R&D uh, annual meeting in Copenhagen, it's also the place where we are actually having um, citizen assemblies in, in Copenhagen. Um, and sorry for, for this <laughs> uh, kind of you're just jumping into this democracy garage. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the partner of We Do Democracy, and we are facilitating citizen assemblies in, uh, in Denmark, uh, having facilitated about 20 citizen assembly, mostly on a local level. Uh, and actually Copenhagen is trying to actually write down uh, uh, implement some of the recommendation from this task force by having this citywide uh, citizen assembly, but also a hoc uh, citizen assembly on a more local level in Copenhagen. And all those citizen assemblies is actually kind of, you know, we are, we are facilitating those assemblies in democracy garage. So also for the Copenhagen, this is a kind of a place where actually, wow, we can strengthen the democracy muscles and uh, have the dis discussions about uh, how to develop the city. So, so and uh, it's quite new. So uh, I can just say, well, it's a hard work, but it's kind of, you know, giving something back to the cities that democracy is actually a thing that we can go to and involve into and have those kind of discussion that we also had in, the, in, this, uh, in this task force. Thanks, Johan. Yeah, great to hear from you as well, and to have another another perspective from from another from another country here. Uh, it was definitely an inspiring space to be in. So I think James shared the link uh, in the chat if anyone wants to have a look of like what what does this look like, um, and it, it really like brought to mind for us this importance of the the physical aspect of, as well. So. Thank you. Um, I see that Robbie has his hand up, uh, so I will um, over to over to Robbie, please. Thank you, Claudia. I've I've got a question for for Daniel and 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 Defoma, and really for anybody else who might have experience of this. Something that's always interested me is this issue of accountability. So once the uh, the let's assume the deliberations have been really positive, they've been as the deliberative process has been as good as it could be. The the legitimacy of why this group who made you the boss of us has been as handled as well as possible. I, what then happens with the allocation of budget? That, because so often the deliberate, the delivery responsibility won't be with that group of the people who did the deliberation. Uh, 
So at what stage do you start to manage that art of the possible so that the deliberations are being set up to succeed as much as possible? And then a supplementary, how do you help people to review the progress of the deliberations? Because so often the people will be spending the money managing the projects won't be the people who did the deliberating. Two interlinked questions, which I think go to the heart of strengthening this whole process and its legitimacy in, in, in wider society. Hmm. Uh, um, I'd like to, is that what you're going to... Please, the format. Yeah, yeah, I was about to, I was about to uh, ask you to, to, to jump yeah. in, so go for it. I think that's a really, really great question. And I think what, for, you know, my understanding of the Citizens Assembly and what's rooted in it, I think the flexibility of it is that it's not a one-off thing. That it can be something that's really integrated into a project and even integrated into review. So it's not about just to how did we arrive at the decision, but then also how are we who who's involved in like in in the the touch points after a decision has been made, and um and so I think just in in combination for what the two questions that you're asking I think is involving the citizen assembly throughout the entire process even in in review you know even even after a project has been implemented you know constantly involved in touch points and it's almost like a, a little a governance mechanism in itself and it, it really is flexible in the, in that you can it, it doesn't have to be like we formed assembly and then it just went away and it's only involved for one aspect of a planning process but that it can be involved in that this citizens assembly can be involved in implementation as well. And I even see this like in a project that I'm working on, which is not necessarily a government project, but it's a, a large scale master planning project where we formed a sort of like a citizen assembly to, to be involved in the planning, but that they then will turn into a governing mechanism for this new community that's being developed. And so we'll be continuously involved in the accountability and even the leadership of this new community. And so, you know, a citizen assembly is a great beginning touch point to develop a more robust governance that is democratic, that is participatory, that, you know, that holds all parties accountable, and that has the people who are benefiting from the act or decision involved in the process of review. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I fully support everything Ifoma said. I think she, she hit the nail on the head. Um, we try to fully integrate our uh, citizen panels um, into our design processes um, and our wider engagement processes. So for example, we might have wide public engagement that then we report on to the panel in a meeting where then they'll take that feedback and develop like a vision statement, design a set of, a set of design principles and then big moves that can then be taken and used um, by the designer to start developing, and sometimes also in collaboration with them through like a workshop or a charrette, start developing design options that then we come back to the panel and we iterate on those design options. We, we select a preferred design and we continue. And we're also using, experimenting with using citizen, um, citizen assemblies in the way FOMA described as these implementation kind of mechanisms as well. So we just, <clears throat> excuse me, we just had our first meeting of a new panel that we've formed um, uh, around uh, the implementation of a, of, a, of a master plan for Toronto Island Park, which is a very large and important park um, in Toronto's harbour harbor front that is uh, an island. And it contains uh, one of the most important um, LGBTQ2S plus spaces in Canada, which is a, a clothing optional beach called Hamlin's Point. And we've created a, a group of folks that we've brought together through a civic lottery to be representative of the beach population, these big beach users, and they're going to be helping us to by guiding us in in in, in the implementation of of the master plan as it relates to the beach. Mm. Thank you, fascinating, fascinating. Thank you so much. Yeah, th thank you both, uh, Ifoma and Daniel. And maybe if I can just add a, a little bit, because we're also, I mean, it's a really, really crucial question around accountability. And one of the ways, because I was involved in designing the, um, like the Paris and the Brussels assemblies that I was mentioning earlier that are permanent and anchored. So for example, 
in the in the Brussels uh, Assembly on Climate, um, there's a subcommittee that gets made up with 10 people who are randomly selected from amongst the whole assembly to be uh, a group who ends up having a follow up process a bit more intensively with the with the minister, with the administration. So every six months for at least 18 months, there's like a, a reconnection with that group to get an update of where are things with implementation? How are things going? Are there other challenges that came up? Um, and then there's also a communication that goes out to the wider group, but actually having that convening that happens with a subset of the group and 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 that also remaining a, a, a more representative group and not just the ones who are maybe the most likely to want to volunteer to take on such a role. So continuing to bring in those principles throughout and, and trying to think of it in a more holistic kind of um, loop way is one of the things we've experimented with. I still feel like this is an aspect where we could be actually experimenting and thinking about it even in even more ways. Um, but just to give another example of a different way that it's been being applied and tried elsewhere too. So, thank you, Robbie. Um, I see we have one more hand up from Kim, uh, if you'd like to come in, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Kim Alonso here. I'm very excited to um, be part of this discussion. And um, I am currently wearing two hats. One of a doctoral student uh, who is interested in public deliberation, more so in non-democratic societies. And the other hat is one of a local government practitioner uh, who works as the uh, you know, director of economic development. So I deal with a lot of the uh, developers and also the citizen uh, pushback on, on projects. But I'm more so interested um, about this, this concept because from a theoretical standpoint, it makes sense uh, for non-democratic societies because you have uh, places where representative democracy has constantly failed uh, people, but from a practitioner standpoint, how do we go about institutionalizing public democracy or um, citizen assemblies in non-democratic societies? Um, great, thank you, Kim. Apologies for the slight <laughs> um, the issues with the with the spotlight. We're gonna we're gonna bring our all our speakers back here in a in a second. But I think those are those are very good questions. I don't know if um, if if Uma or or Daniel or or James, you would like to um, yeah come in, come in on those. Yeah, it's a tough one. <laughs> I'm not really sure to, where to begin with that. I mean, uh, this is something actually something also that we've talked about with with Yeva, who's unfortunately had to leave uh, a little bit early, so she's not with us now. But I, I mean, um, in on non democratic societies, working in such a um, in such a way is, is much more difficult naturally, <laughs> of course. Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, if Claudia, if you have anything to, I mean, to, to comment on that, I'm not sure where to go with that myself. So, mm. um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's an interesting question overall because the, I think there's also a tension of what's possible at a national level and what's possible at a local level in, in non-democratic or less democratic societies. Like we have seen actually at like processes like citizens assemblies taking place in what can be considered non-democratic countries in a national way, actually taking place in cities where there are mayors or local leaders who are wanting to do things differently and sort of, you know, showing another path forward. So I would say that like, this is the sort of thing that shouldn't be discouraged just because of maybe there's a wider situation. And I appreciate this is maybe not a context where we've had as much experience working in either. I, I certainly haven't myself directly uh, as much, but we have been in touch through a wider network of other people who I think would consider themselves as operating in, in these kind of contexts. So I think it's a very good question and one that I've definitely noted down, noted down for us. Um, Daniel? Yeah, just a, a, a quick thought is that, you know, if you frame um, in, in, in more authoritarian contexts, if you frame a citizens assembly as being more about um, excellence in decision making and less mm -hmm. about, you know, that, 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 that members of the public can get behind, which I think, you know, 
even autocrats uh, exist because uh, people allow them to exist ultimately. Um, you know, and so people don't want uh, an unhappy citizenry, right? So I think focusing on the value towards good decision making might be an avenue there as opposed to focusing on the value from, you know, a public participation perspective. Mm. That's a good point. And actually, it makes me think of a last point on this, that actually sometimes there's more openness because it's sortition and not elections. Um, so there's something that feels less threatening somehow with with these kinds of approaches too. So um, a last kind of point on on that. Uh, I see that Adrian has uh, has his hand up as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the conversation. On that point, I saw in the chat that somebody uh, mentioned that uh, it has been used in China. And uh, I recently uh, discovered that myself uh, with a friend that, uh, uh, talked about this experience. And I was very surprised and interested also to know how it went. Uh, so I think now the CEPS, uh, Center for European Studies in, in Brussels, uh, has been through this type of exp experiences and mm. they should provide uh, insight about that. But this also raises point of, uh, yes, using uh, participation, deliberative democracy as a tool for efficient uh, policy making, and uh, with maybe the, the, the threat to do, uh, let's say, policy without politics. And this is also uh, something that this question for me underlines that even uh, undemocratic uh, regime can uh, use uh, participatory or deliberative democracy. And um, yeah, so it's also important to reflect on uh, how to use it in a way that it also sustains uh, democracy in general. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to come in on this. I actually have a few a few thoughts my, myself, actually, because I think like when you mentioned actually policy without politics, um, I think it's without politics in the sense of like big P politics of like political parties um, and those sorts of divisions that come with that. But I actually think there's a lot of politics within citizens assemblies and within these sort of processes. But the small P politics where we're almost like allowed to have conversations about politics because no one has to say what party they support first. Uh, and we can just talk about what are the issues. And it's actually very political to be thinking about, you know, what do, how, how do we want the future of this city to be, you know, what do we think about the future of housing or mobility or whatever it is and whatever issue comes up um so i think there's actually i, I kind of feel like there's been almost like a, um, a vacuum of being able to have certain kinds of political debates because of how polarized and divisive party politics has become around certain issues and these spaces are also these deliberative spaces are like reopening uh an ability to to be able to to have those political discussions about policy um at the end of at the end of the day as well but i don't know if 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 others disagree with with that um would curious you yes. know if Uma, daniel what you think or james were you about to come in no no no. i just have to agree with that it doesn't mm -hmm. definitely is like a political element to the to the assembly kind of process itself um and the in the way that people are having to have conversations with each other and and form a consensus as well i mean that is that is not an easy process and it takes expert facil facilitation but it also takes a lot of uh, compromise in a lot of ways to to be able to um, understand your own point of view and to understand other point other people's points of view and be able to come to an agreement or a general agreement anyways on what um, on what recommendations they'll produce so sorry Adrian I know you were trying to say something as well I know uh, I understand of course this point uh, what I wanted to to underline thank you James um, was the the fact that yes in some processes uh, we have this, uh, we have seen that. I wanted to mention the work of a, a, a similar organization that is working on what we call citizen washing now, and uh, that tries to identify uh, when uh, that type of participatory processes have been uh, have led actually to uh, processes that are more about informing citizens about the decision that has been already made, etc. And um, well, this is just to underline also that uh, even if there is a lot of uh, appetite uh, currently, at least in Europe, uh, for the topic, uh, we have also, uh, unfortunately, 
uh, some let's say practices that are um, discrediting also uh, participatory democracy and i think it's also a challenge for organizations for practitioners um, to continue working in this condition and to still demonstrate efficiency and reliability accountability to the citizens mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a it's a fair point. Just to to re to reiterate for for everybody around the, um, I mean, if I understood correctly, around the point that like there there is some sense of like citizen washing and participatory or deliberative engagements that are happening, um, without necessarily the the intentions or the openness of this actually being something that is is um meant to be taken very very seriously and the kind of risks that come with that happening as well. If I if I hear you correctly, um, I, and I see Daniel nodding. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know if uh, I I don't get a sense. Maybe either of you want to kind of jump in on that directly. I think we're getting close to the end of of our of our time though. So perhaps maybe I don't know if if Ipoma and Daniel you each wanted to share just any last final reflections and and uh, and then we're gonna kind of wrap up for for our session. So maybe Ipoma first. Uh, if there's anything like through today's conversation that also came up for you. Um, I think you know the the power of its use of, as a tool for working in marginalized communities. I think is is the the point that I want to drive home. Um, I think in in my work in particular, it always becomes very challenging that you can have, you know, New York City. We have community boards. We have, you know, people involved in the urban land use review process. So we have town hall. You know, we have all different kinds forms of um of processes for involving the public but oftentimes it's the loudest voice that get gets heard it's the people who have access to resources that know when these meetings are happening or know when changes are happening in the public and so this idea that you can like randomly select people in the general like public to be involved and it can be a part of your duty like jury duty um that is, is a really enticing one. Um, I think because there are so many of us, myself included, as just like a a member of the broader New York community that are not involved in community boards. We're not involved in these um, political systems and oftentimes are a bit clueless to what is happening in, in the city uh, because you don't, you don't know when the meeting is happening. You don't know where it's happening. And so I think it can be really, as we as it relates to city government and governance of cities, it can be a really great tool for making a process more democratic. And then if you're thinking about other forms of participatory processes, whether it's developers developing large projects or even working on community-oriented projects, even for a nonprofit organization working in a community, to have a citizens assembly, to have a council, to have a, a group or a body of people that are collectively making decisions is so key to sustainability of a project. And so, yeah, that's, I'll just end with that. Thank you so much for inviting me. Fantastic. Thanks, Ifoma. Daniel? Uh, yeah, and, and I'll second everything Ifoma just said, and just, you know, thinking from my, my own perspective about, you know, the, 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 the challenge of engaging people outside of those usual suspects who, 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 who have the privilege and ability to participate um, you know, all the time, um, the people who tend to be selected through a civic lottery process um, come to the table with a different kind of attitude than those usual suspects. You know, they, they it's not, they don't, don't, they don't come to the table from a place of self-interest. Typically, they're much more open to, um, to, to, to learning from others. They recognize typically that they don't have all the solutions themselves probably because they haven't often thought about them themselves. And this might be the first time they're thinking about these things um, uh, in the way that we're asking them to. And so there's a, a, an openness to learn. There is a, a, a much more of a willingness to be constructive and, and, and a gratitude. Um, you know, like I was, wow, thank you so much for selecting me. And, and, and I'm going to take this role really seriously and, and really try to, to play the part of like someone who represents my my community, whatever that may be, um, 
and think and think through the lens of of other people in my in my immediate community. So, you know, uh, it's it's just a, a really, as I said, magical magical thing that happens, and I'm really heartened by uh, all of the people who come out today and who have expressed interest in this in this tool and in this framework. And um, and again, I also want to thank Democracy Next for uh, for inviting me to be part of this whole process. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Afuma. It's been wonderful to have both of you and also our wider international task force members involved. And also, I do want to recognize there was a wider group of, of stakeholders who gave feedback and joined a few different virtual calls and reorganized a few different meetings at different places who, who gave feedback along the way. So we did mention them all at the start of the report, but this has been quite a, a collaborative and collective effort to get to a point of, of having some concrete proposals that we've shared with you today. So, you know, thank you very much and thanks to all of you for, for joining the, the launch of our paper today. This was a really rich uh, conversation and exchange, some very, very good questions. Um, and I also really want to thank the whole Democracy Next team for their hard work on this paper, uh, because really every single one of them uh, was involved, was involved too. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming, for joining us. It was great to see well over 100 people join today. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have a lot of people registered for tomorrow's event as well, which is great. So um, if this work excites you, please share it widely. If you are working in a city or if you know somebody who is who wants to implement this work, then please share it as much as you can. We're, we're eager to partner with people in the next year and uh, yeah, eager to make this, this sort of um, framework or this, the, these proposals a reality. So. Thank you for everyone. Thank you to everyone for joining. And thank you again also to our speakers. It was great to see you. It was great to see you both. Wonderful. Thanks very much. And, and we really do encourage you to, to apply and, and join our info sessions if you're interested next week. Uh, we really do believe that we can be changing the future of our cities to be thriving in healthy places by changing the ways in which we are deciding together about our city's future. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight and hopefully we'll be in touch with you soon. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Great. Thank you.